Hello, everyone. Welcome to this exciting launch event for Transformation in Times of Crisis, one of the most important and timely books in recent business history. Two leading experts on business transformation, Emphasis CEO Nitin Rakesh and Wharton Professor Jerry Wind, have written a book filled with big picture ideas and practical advice. In addition to hearing from Nitin and Jerry, we'll also be joined by John Chambers, the visionary former CEO of Cisco, and Phil Kotler, who is known as a father of modern marketing. My name is Sri Srinivasan, and I'm the former Chief Digital Officer of New York, the Metropolitan Museum, and Columbia University. So I know firsthand how complicated it is to do digital transformation in the old so-called normal days, and how much more complicated and difficult it has become during the days of the pandemic. Get ready to take notes and tell your friends and colleagues about what you're learning today. The hashtag is transform in time and the website for the book is transformation in times of crisis.com. Thank you for joining us from wherever you are in the world. We're live on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. A big special welcome to our viewers on CNBC TV 18 and your story. We have exciting things planned for the next hour, so please tell us where you're watching from. Please ask your questions, and there will be polls that you can participate in. Here's how you can access them. We're using a tool called Slido.com, which allows you to ask questions. So go to Slido.com and type in transform in time, or just use the QR code. Again, Slido.com, transform in time or just use the QR code you have in front of you. Now, let me bring on stage the stars of today, Jerry Wynn and Nitin Rakesh. Hello, gentlemen. We are excited to have both Nitin and Jerry with us here today. As we get ready to bring them on, let me... Hi, gentlemen, welcome. Good morning. Hello, hi, Sri. Great to have you here. Uh, let's give everyone a quick rundown of your bios. Nitin is a distinguished leader in the tech and financial services industries and has been the, emphasis, the CEO of Emphasis since 2017. His career spans more than two decades leading large transnational operations and delivering transformative digital solutions to Fortune 500 companies. And Jerry is a internationally renowned and award-winning academic and is the Lauder Professor Emer Emeritus and Professor of Marketing at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. His pioneering research on organizational buying behavior, market segmentation, conjoint analysis, and marketing strategy has made him one of the most cited authors in marketing. We have a short video to get us started. Super exciting, and we are delighted to talk about this book. It is called Transformation in Times of Crisis. And my first question to our guests is, what is the inspiration for the, writing this book and why this topic? We'll start with Nitin. Thanks, Sri. Really excited to be here. Thank you all for joining us for this wonderful <clears throat> launch. Uh, I think, you know, if you look at the last few years, the world is going through some blistering change in everyday life, in business, in environment. And, you know, it's a little bit of that avalanche story, you know, it gathers steam and it gathers steam and, it, you know, the pace of change continue, continue to accelerate. And along came this crisis and everything just got further accelerated. So we just wanted to kind of talk about what are those principles that can help companies and individuals transform using the crisis as an opportunity to look for new areas to grow in. And that really was the inspiration, you know, create a, a best practice model that people can use and apply to their businesses and themselves. Excellent. Let's ask Jerry the same question. Thanks, Reem. Uh, well, we actually started working in another book on uh, the architecture of disruption two years ago. And then when the crisis started, we uh, wrote an article for Norget Wharton on opportunities in time of crisis and realized that everything we talked about in terms of the architecture of disruption applies to the crisis and decided to flip 
and write this book. And the idea is, is uh, articulated by Nitin uh, to really help uh, leaders in uh, transform in this uh, time and create new opportunities. And the idea here really is not only to focus on business leaders, but leaders of all organizations, nonprofits, and even governments. Eight prince. The the book has eight principles that uh, are highlighted. Let's talk about a few of them. So, Nitin, over to you. Thanks, Ray. I mean, if you if you start looking at the list of principles we've identified, uh, I mean, the first one really is the it's the starting block, right? How do you change your beliefs and get out of your comfort zone? Because if you don't, then the environment will force you to do. So, I think that's really the first principle. To talk about action orientation, lean forward have the desire to actually implement these changes. And, you know, we've cited examples from multiple, you know, companies that have managed to do that. Uh, you know, many companies were born in the crisis of 2008-9 and have really thrived since. And, and we're seeing the same thing play out now as well. And then you start thinking about how has, you know, consumer behavior changed over the last 10 years. And we see a very dramatic shift, right? The loyalties of customers and stakeholders have moved away from being to brands to actually being to experiences, ease of doing business, you know, anytime, anywhere, banking, for example. So I think there are multiple lessons to be learned for how do you reinvent your approach to customers? How do you speed up your own digital transformation, for example, right? The world has moved from being omni-channel mindset over the last 10 years to suddenly digital first, and in many cases, digital only in the last you know, in a few months. So how do you really apply this transformation construct to speed up your trans digital transformation? How do you, you know, embrace this concept of predicting customer needs and personalizing your services and your products to those you know customers and, and consumers and really you know how do you you know expand into adjacencies and, and businesses that are near neighbor right uber uh, uber eats great examples i think we've really tried to to use some of those principles and and, and bring together to life some stories from real life and and kind of imbibe them in, in these learnings you know jerry will talk about you know a few of the other principles there as well right uh so let me emphasize again the importance of challenging your mental models. And I think it's actually one of the points also that John makes in his uh, book on connecting the dots on uh, that you get disrupted because you don't disrupt yourself. Uh, so once you challenge your mental models, let me focus on some of the other areas. Uh, I think it's absolutely critical to innovate, continuously innovate, and especially in time of crisis to try to create new opportunities and then experiment. Uh, experimentation is the absolutely critical in today's environment as opposed to just doing, you know, what an initiative, start thinking about how do you experiment to try to identify the causal link between what you're doing and the results you're getting. And also leverage natural experiments that exist today. Um, in uh, principle seven, we suggest primarily the idea to focus not only on initiatives which are relevant today, but even today, in time of crisis, to start thinking about how do we start building toward the future and design experiments and initiatives that relate across time horizons. And finally, the, the, the last principle we're kind of articulating and suggest is to start with an idealized design. Start by where would you like to be in the future? What is the view? And then actually work backward from there as a, a backward planning and then recreate your organization. And very important as part of it is to focus on the right corporate culture and the, the people and the talent involved here. And when you talk about talent, let's not limit this only to the internal talent you hire, but also to focus on uh, open talent, which is an increasing trend today, together with the move toward open innovation. But the idea is to look at all of these principles. And in the book, we actually propose also a framework for implementation and add a number of tools that help you implement the various ideas we have. Thank you so much, uh, everyone. Uh, we are talking to the co-authors of the brand new book, Transformation in Times of Crisis. I'd love both our authors to just hold up the book so we can't do a regular launch. So we'll have to presume this is a, there's a ribbon cutting, cutting and so much more. Great to see that. I'm going to take myself off screen. So you have just the two authors there. Just hold up the book, please. It's just great to uh, see you both with the book right 
Okay, okay. so now let's uh, look at uh, some of the comments that have been coming in. People are participating and watching from around the world, thousands of people. Uh, here we have a comment, just read the forward and first principle yesterday. Great read so far. Congratulations, Nitin and Rakesh from LinkedIn. We have uh, Paul saying great list. Number six is my favorite. Can we go back to the slides? Let's look at what is number six. Uh, uh, number six is innovate, then experiment, experiment, experiment. Nitin, can you tell us a little bit more about that principle? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, think about the, the concept that, you know, you need to bring to life, which is, you know, you're seeing such rapid change in the environment, in the consumer behavior, in the ability to apply, you know, new products and services. Think about, you know, customer uh, you know, needs being predicted. So I think the only way you can keep up with that mindset is by actually building a culture of innovation and experimentation, you know, what we call pay the past. And, and keep innovating across multiple horizons, as Jerry said. Don't think about what's relevant today. Think about what's relevant, you know, year out, two years out. And of course, you have to seed these experiments, you know, in a way that you can you can you know run them through the maturity curve and identify which one of those trends continue to actually be relevant to your business. I think uh, extremely important to have that you know experimentation mindset and, and do it across horizons as well. Thank you. Well, we've got so many great comments. The, uh, we have a viewer from New Jersey. Uh, we have Tamanna saying uh, huge congratulations to Nitin and Jerry. Excited with the book launch from Pune, India. Arun is watching from Sri Lanka, and great to have you. Chirag is watching from Seattle. Great to have all of you here as we are discussing transformation in times of crisis. Uh, folks, please keep sharing your comments and posting. We'd love to know where you're watching from. Fani says, I wish we had the technology to put the physical books digitally signed live, but you can get your books right now. If you go to your favorite uh, retailer online, you can get it at Amazon. It is available right now, so you can check there as well. But our website is transformationintimesofcrisis.com. Please go there, learn more about the book. You can get those eight principles. You can read the introduction, and please do get the book. The book uh, the proceeds from this book, you should all know, are going to uh, uh, towards uh, doctors of uh, uh, doctors without borders, as well as the Emphasis F1 Foundation. So you can do good while, by also supporting this book. So please do that. Now we are very excited to bring in the first of our two guests to join us. Uh, we are going to be joined right now by John Chambers, the founder and CEO of JC2 Ventures, which focuses on helping disruptive startups from around the world build and scale, while also promoting the broader development of startup nations and a startup world. He's the chairman of the U.S.-India Strategic Partnership Forum, and of course, he's also the former CEO and chairman of Cisco Systems. Please welcome John Chambers. Tree, it's a pleasure to be with you. Jerry and Nitin, congratulations. I love the eight principles. My favorite is the first one. Challenge your own models and stay ahead. Thanks, thanks, John. That's great. Nitin is going to ask some questions and get us started here. Sounds good. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that, uh, guys. You know, John, uh, it's great uh, you know, that you could join us. Thank you very much for doing that. You know, a couple of years ago, I read your book, Connecting the Dots. You know, just, you know, it was hot off the press. And I admired, uh, you know, the the mindset that it's about that, you know, the harder the crisis gets, you know, the, the stronger, you know, you, you have to pivot. So, so can you talk to us a little bit about, you know, the personal journey that you ran through, you know, as you ran Fortune, a Fortune 500 company and that too in a business as disruptive as tech? Well, the journey is one that you're as much a product of your setbacks as you are your successes. Uh, the reason that I've, I liked your first principle so much is you've got to disrupt yourself before somebody else disrupts you. And if you were to look at today's model, probably 50% of the large companies around the world won't exist in 10 years. And this terrible pandemic and economic crisis is actually going to accelerate that. However, what's been different in this transformation this time is the small companies, high tech companies, venture capital back, have gone through it much smoother. They reinvented themselves during the 2000 uh, dot com crisis. 50% of the startups venture capital back disappeared worldwide. Now, 2008, 30%. So you'd say mathematically, probably about 40% would disappear this time. That has not happened. They've reinvented themselves and the availability of nearly tens of uh, uh, trillions of economic stimulus have helped navigate through that. 
Thank you. Uh, Jerry, you have a question for John? Well, uh, in the sense, what I liked about your book, a lot of the principles you suggest there also relate to what we are actually suggesting. Uh, the changing metal models is really at the core of everything. Um, but I was really intrigued with um, your focus on the network architecture uh, that allowed you at Cisco the flexibility to uh, acquire companies and grow at this amazing rate that you have done. So since one of my earlier books was on network orchestration, I'd love to hear your kind of perspective on how you created the network uh, architecture. Well, Jerry, it, it's my honor. Uh, I originally viewed playbooks or process as something that slows you down as a company. <clears throat> and I was very wrong on that. Uh, basically, if you have a playbook, much like a professional sports team, that everybody knows the patterns they're supposed to run and how they pass the ball, et cetera, you can move with tremendous speed. Now, one of those playbooks is all around acquisitions. <clears throat> I had the honor to do 180 of them. I, I think most people would say that we were the model for how do you acquire companies uh, in the technology industry over the last three decades. Probably two thirds of them hit or exceeded what uh, our goals were on it. But it was a basic playbook that you run with speed. We decided to acquire a company on a Thursday night that I didn't even know the name of, meet with the CEO on Friday and do a $3 billion acquisition announced through both boards on a Monday. So the ability to move with speed and innovate, disrupt yourself before others do, uh, and getting replicatable patterns built into your culture is a key aspect of differentiation. That's great. The challenge is how do you get the leaders that have the courage to do it? Well, this is where you're knitting your question and Jerry, where you're leading me. I'm a product of my past. I came out of West Virginia, uh, a very uh, great state uh, during the 60s and 70s when I grew up, uh, at the chemical center of the world, coal mining center of the world. Yet because we didn't change, we got left behind and became one of the more challenged states. And we're trying to fix that. I was in Boston 128 when it was the Silicon Valley of the world. And because we didn't change, Silicon Valley uh, grew out of it. And it is your, your background of how you manage through those crises. At Cisco, I managed through five economic crises. Uh, we came out of each one stronger than we went into them. But boy, they were painful. And if we didn't have the courage to change, Jerry and Denton, we would have got left behind, as most of my competitors did. To your point, you, you focus not on your competition, you focus on speed and transformation and innovation and build that into your culture. That's awesome. Thank you so much, John. Uh, to everyone who's watching, we have thousands of people watching from around the world. Great comments are coming in. Please keep telling us where you're watching from and also participate in our poll. You can go to slido.com and type in transform in time slido.com slash transform in time, or just use this QR code. Now I'm very excited to bring in another guest into this uh, conversation. He wrote the forward for the book, Bill Kotler is with us. He's known around the world as the father of modern marketing. For over 50 years, he's taught at the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern. His book, Marketing Management, is the most widely used textbook in marketing around the world. Please welcome Phil Kotler. Hello. Uh, I'm so excited about this opportunity. Uh, first of all, Nitin, I haven't met you, but it's a pleasure. And of course, I knew Jerry for 25 or more years, and I've copied some of his things without telling him because he's been so original in his work. Now, I am so excited about the book for the following reason: reasons. You, you saved me a lot of time because you really wrote a, something that would have taken eight books. Every one of the eight principles is a book itself. And I wasn't going to do that. I, when I saw it was all in one small book, I said, thank you very much. It's very important that every company look at not just the chapter that interests them, because these chapters are interrelated. And the nice thing is that the authors give you a way to scan where you stand on each of the principles. And of course, you should ultimately correct those weak stands you might have, where you 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 suddenly realize you're you're a little behind. So I'm very excited about the value of this book. In other words, this book has created value. 
It's great. Jerry, I know, has some questions for you. We'll just take a look at a couple of comments here that are coming in. Jerry's son watching in Philadelphia. Congratulations to Nithin and my dad. Very inspiring. Great to have you, John, with us. Uh, uh, Bala Subramaniam says, simple but powerful eight mantras in successful transformation in times of crisis. Much needed wisdom. Jerry and Nithin, congratulations. And Aishwarya says, we studied Phil Kotler in college in our advertising class. It's such a privilege to watch him speak live. So that's wonderful. Jerry, over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. Um, a few years ago, you wrote the book Marketing 4.0. Even though it was uh, in, I think, 2016, this seems like ages ago compared to what we have now. What is going to be Marketing 5.0? Uh, you know, I happen to have 4.0 here. I didn't plan to show it because I didn't know you'd ask the question. But um, it is true that uh, 4.0 <clears throat> was really say that marketing has undergone a revolution. It has gone digital. And then it's no longer, marketing is no longer having placing some ads broadcast and print on TV and so on and pricing your product. That's the old marketing. We don't want to give up a lot of the older marketing, but if you're gonna just coast on the older marketing, you won't be around. The fact is that the new marketing is about uh, collecting data, uh, big data, getting to know our individual customers, getting to know what they care about, what they want from you, from, from the society and the economy, and, and showing your caring, showing that, so look, the main principles are first called CRM, uh, customer relationship uh, management. Another principle is is uh, corporate social responsibility, uh, and those are things that we have to pay attention to. I do want to mention one thing. As I read your book, I looked at the book that I wrote recently called Never Stop. Never Stop is the story of real innovation. Because what if you were Fuji film and you lost your whole market overnight? No, one's need, no one needs the, the green box of film. Well, we know what happened. Kodak disappeared, by the way, because Kodak was slow in moving into digitalization. But in the case of uh, Fuji film, I worked with the CEO, uh, uh, CEO uh, Dr. Kamari, and he has taken this as a wonderful time to invent brand new things. So I was so impressed that he's now into medical products. He's into skincare products. He's into, he found that his company was a treasure house of competencies and capacities. And his problem was trying to decide which moves and industries they should move into. There were too many that were facing him and what an imagination. And I know you developed this as one of your principles about innovation. And by the way, Drucker taught us two things, marketing and innovation. If your company is only, is not good at either, you're through. If you're only good at marketing, but you have a poor product, that's not gonna cover anything. If you're only good at innovation, but you don't know how to market, but you create it, that won't help. So Drucker's with us all the time. Great, Thank great you. point. Phil, let me ask you another question. Uh, you just, you started about 10 years ago, the World Marketing Summit. And a few months ago, you just had it, the first virtual uh, event with amazing participation of over a million people from like 100 countries, 60 speakers. Uh, this is an amazing transformation from a traditional kind of activity to this uh, e-world marketing summit. Could you share with us a little bit some of the struggles and challenges and how did you deal with this uh, transformation? Yes, uh, my uh, group uh, is has been busy running every year conferences in a country like India or Russia uh, or Brazil where we would bring 10 of the top marketing people to talk about what they might do to improve their business performance. Well, uh, when the COVID took place, there's no way to get audiences together in person. So
So we said, what could we do to keep doing the World Marketing Summit, not country by country, but rather around the world? And we needed a tremendous system of, first of all, we wanted to select, and we selected you, Jerry, too, 90 presenters, 90 presenters from around the world, not from just the United States or Europe. And then we had to make sure that we covered pricing, product, innovation, all the things. And uh, it worked beautifully. All the speakers created very informative talks. And we're going to, of course, put a lot of this in books or in other accessible uh, means. But the purpose was to raise the level of marketing practice and understanding and digitalization in the world. Thank you. That's great. Phil, um, you know, if I may ask you a question as well, you know, firstly, it's, uh, what a great honor it is for me to share the screen with you. I mean, we grew up reading your books when I went to business school, uh, you know, back in the early 90s. Uh, and I never imagined that uh, I'd be on the same screen with you and I would have set the same stage, but you know, unfortunately, that's not happening either here. So thank you so much for being part of this show and thank you so much for your kind words for the book. And I learned a lot from Jerry as well during the, you know, the process. And, and I'm really glad that we could have you join us. Thank you. You know, my question to you was, uh, you know, as you look at the crisis, uh, you know, what do you think has been the one, you know, most important aspect of what people need to do to come out of the crisis and be on the winning side of it? Well, that's a, a big question because I wrote three or four papers on how to handle crisis, uh, COVID. You know, the first question is this. We want to come back to what people call normal, namely the life we led before with people all the time and enjoying things. And we want to get back to that. But, you know, we can't, the question comes up, are we going to have a V-shaped return a recovery or a U-shaped recovery? Some industries have to have a V-shaped recovery, the hospitals and healthcare, uh, the, the electric utilities, construction, they'll come back pretty fast. But what do you do when an industry depends on customers who you're going to deal with personally, like beauty shops and and and, uh, and restaurants and hotels, and they're going to be a little slower in getting back to the performance levels they had. I mean, I'm predicting it's going to be about three to five years to get back to the levels that those. Uh, uh, companies uh, companies uh, that had lots of people to serve will get back uh, to normal. And the, the other question is, what do we want in the new normal? Uh, do we want it to be like the old normal? Is that a good, good enough? I, I think we have to face the next crisis, which is climate change. And that alone means we got to start being people who watch how much uh, carbon we generate even when we fly on a plane, should we fly as much as we're doing? Maybe we should go back to bicycles. Uh, so the point I'm, I'm trying to say is uh, it's, uh, there's a thing I'm working on with a group called the seven wicked problems. Of course, war, income inequality, uh, climate change, besides COVID. So we're dealing with COVID now, but we have to deal with a lot of other things sensibly. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Bill. Uh, thank you very much. We are getting some uh, feedback from our audience. And so we're going to go to show everyone the results of our Slido polling that we've been doing. And we'll, of course, bring John into our conversation as well. Everybody, please go to slido.com and go into transformation, transform in time, and you can participate. You can fill in the survey. Here is the uh, QR code that you can use. But we have some early responses that we wanted to show our, uh, our, our team and to hear from them. Uh, what have you done to innovate during this crisis? We have several ways in which people have, have talked. We have other questions as well that we want to show you. Uh, let's ask John to respond to this. John, here are some words that people used to describe your life in 2021. So they're looking ahead. Uh, what do you see when you see these results? When I look at these results, it's almost what Phil referred to and Nitin and Jerry wrote about in their book. Uh, the way you manage through a crisis is you want to be realistic about how much was self-inflicted and how much was market-inflicted, and it's usually the combination of the two. 
Then you run your three to five major programs to recover from that crisis, communicate regularly with your employees, your shareholders, your customers, et cetera. And then you have to move from playing defense to playing offense to say, what is your North Star? What are you hopeful about? And bring your organization and your customers and your marketing with you in terms of how you're going to merge out of this in a stronger place. So I think it, it, it plays back mm -hmm. to that two-step, how you deal with crisis management and hopeful, I think, is the right word. I'm more than hopeful. I think we will see the crisis abate dramatically uh, during the second half of this next calendar year. And in the U.S., as an example, and I think India might lag by a quarter, we'll probably see 45% GDP growth the second half of the calendar year. Those numbers are staggering if you think about it, but uh, thank you for that. Let's see if Phil has a thought on these words uh, on the screen. Hopeful, exciting. Well, ex exciting uh, gets to me because uh, I think the world's a, a very exciting place, uh, whether you're living through a crisis or living through good times. Uh, <clears throat> and, and the thing is, watch out for complacency. Uh, there's a lot of firms that have uh, handled the crisis. Uh, they, one of the things the crisis taught us is you've got to go into <clears throat> the digital age. And there are deniers. There are companies that are still selling enough and they, they, they're, they're successful without being digital. Well, they're deniers or they're avoiders or they're camouflagers. They camouflage, oh, yes, uh, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. But the digital world is going to get more and more, uh, need more skills. And one of the principles that Jerry and Nathan talked about is uh, getting the talent. Now, here's the problem. If you have a, a lot of people working for you and your company, and they don't have digital skill, what do you do? Do you say, well, we'll teach you skill. We'll give you every opportunity to become skillful in using AI and other things. But that's not enough. You've got to bring in new people who already have the deepest level of skill. But there's a balance here. That means you've got some people who are not really going to have the, the skill set you need for tomorrow. Uh, let me just put it this way. One of the reasons Kodak failed and, and Fujifilm didn't is Kodak was a chemical company and, and it had a bunch of chemists, but what they needed were electrical people, electronic people, and, and, and they didn't move fast enough because they are stuck with a lot of chemists to, to do what has to be done in the electrical age. So uh, every one of you must ask, what's the skill set of people that I'm going to need, and am I moving fast enough in that direction? Thank you very much. Uh, let me remind everyone that we are watching a conversation with the great mm -hmm. Phil Kotler, as well as the great John Chambers, and we are talking to the co-authors of the brand new book, Transformation in Times of Crisis, Nitin Rakesh and Jerry Wind. Uh, please check out the book. You can find it on transformationintimesofcrisis.com. And please share this. We're live on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. Tag your friends. There's somebody in the world who would benefit from watching this. As soon as it's over, the replay will start right here. Let's take another look at one of the poll questions that we had and see here is a question on a scale of one to five. You've seen the optimist. You can see the optimism really high in there. What do you say to the people who, uh, we, you know, who aren't as optimistic? What should they be doing to become more optimistic? Let's go to John first on that question. Well, I, I think if you watch great leaders, and I actually strongly believe you have one of the top leaders I've ever met in India, uh, in Prime Minister Modi, the first thing they do is inspire hope. Then they get you to believe it's possible. Then they bring you on the journey that it is very doable. And then they point out the successes along the way. So what you have to do is paint the picture, the playbook, whatever you want to call it for how you end up coming out of this and you've got to move yourself and usually the challenge is the ceo himself or herself about being optimistic but realistically putting the meat behind it to achieve those goals so this number is more optimistic than i would thought uh it would be but i think also the people watching this broadcast are by their nature transformational in nature and we're an optimistic group Thank you. We have, uh, we're just going to show another question so that people can answer it and we can come back to the results in a minute. So let's put up a question that we want 
people to answer. Uh, what do you? What have you done to innovate during the crisis? So we've got several comments here that you can pick from to answer this question. So please go to slido.com, transform in time, and we'll come back to the answer to this question in just a bit. You can use the QR code as well. Uh, we have comments coming in from around the world. We're so grateful to everyone. And we have some questions that we want to ask. So we're going to put one of the questions on the screen so that we can ask our team uh, of great experts. What an opportunity for everybody to learn from these questions that have been uh, uh, asked by folks. Uh, were you quick to sense the potential impact of the virus on your business? So first, let me ask that of our uh, of our, our, our CEO, who's the co-author of this book, Nathan Rakesh of Emphasis. Uh, how did you know that there was going to be trouble with the virus? Yeah, I think uh, you know, it was you know fairly clear early on that we were going to see some moments of disruption but what wasn't obviously clear was the extent and the scope but you know come march as we talk about in the book uh, i think the world kind of changed within a period of one week and of course the first response and reaction from everybody was to to recover go back to you know some form of continuity but it, it started to become pretty evident i would say within a couple of weeks that this was a major accelerant to a number of the trends that you know phil and john both talked about as well the world has been an exciting place over the last 10 years. I think it just got a lot more exciting with the acceleration of all of those trends. Many of them driven by technology adoption, many of them actually led by the customer behavior change and, 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 and the move away from you know, these traditional modes of engagement. So I think you know, it, it became pretty obvious early on, I would say, you know, as the spring came up. And uh, you know, at that point in time, we had to make certain decisions you know, within our business. Uh, you know, the first thing we had to do really was look at this as an opportunity and effectively uh, i used this term play offense with my team back then and i think that's kind of the, the the first you know aha moment we had early on in april thank you i see a question arpan is asking creativity is the skill set that we will need to imbibe would love to hear john and phil talk and discuss the significance of creativity dr arpan yagnik is from penn state and i know that Jerry has also spent a lot of time thinking about creativity in the arts and how that connects to business. So we'll start with Phil, John, and then Jerry. Uh, yes, I've been always interested in creativity and I wrote uh, first a book called Lateral Marketing, which was how do you get ideas? And you know, it's, and then the second problem is if you got a good idea, how do you make sure it's good and, and test it? Um, and uh, it turns out that um, every company ought to have the following people somewhere. You have to have an, someone who's an activator. He, he's the kind of guy or gal who comes in every day and they say, hey, I just got an idea. I saw this. I saw that. You have to have some people just looking outside into the world and telling you, here's something, ha some things that are happening. Now, that, that activator, we need a second person who's a browser who could take any idea that the company gets to see and he could see whether it's already been done it's already around or it's not or it's real brand new if the browser gives it good clearance we take that idea and take it to a third person who is going to be a creative creator to design something to you could do with that idea then you take it to a developer who can actually fine tune it and put up a factory around the idea. And then you have to have the sales force, I call them executors, and they sell it. And then you got finance always behind you, making sure these steps take place. So we all know that you got to manage innovation very carefully, but I, I worry about this. And I'm very taken with a thing called lean uh, entrepreneurship, lean entrepreneurship, that is to the, the, the initial idea should be something that you uh, do a minimal viable uh, look at, uh, form of it. You test it, you get feedback, you improve it a little. And, and even your marketing is gonna be minimum viable marketing just to see if it takes. So I'm very much uh, interested in something Eric, uh, guy, uh, someone talked about, which is um, lean, entre lean innovation. Yeah, thank you very much. Let's go to John on this question. Well, I, I think the future is every organization in the world will become a digital company. And I agree with what Bill said that, about that, Nitin and Jerry, your all's approaches as well. Uh, people don't understand what that really means. 
It means you're going to have to transform your organization, your structure, et cetera. The speed of innovation, uh, I've been amazed at how it actually accelerated over the last year, not decelerated. And the example of that was the vaccine being developed in nine months for a process that usually takes five years. Uh, if you look at the future, those companies, regardless of survive, that survive, regardless of size, a uh, small company or large company must reinvent itself around a digital architecture. And as you do this, you don't compete against competitors. You basically focus on what are your customers and the business transformation is going on. And what are the new technologies enabled by digitization, the 5G, the Internet of Things, the big data analysis. But artificial intelligence, I personally believe, will be the one technology that enables innovation at a speed we've not seen before. Uh, I think it will be the biggest transformation since the internet in the early 90s, where it changed the way literally you work, live, learn, and play. And I think your models on digitization around artificial intelligence implementation with bots, et cetera, uh, will be the transformational innovators of the future. Uh, if you watch probably the first area within businesses that will receive huge payback from artificial intelligence will be around the uh, customer experience management. And uh, interesting enough, a small company out of uh, India that's really growing at about 300% a year, Unicor, is riding this wave in terms of taking call centers and using the artificial intelligence to dramatically increase your ability to stay close to your customers and for this call into the call center to be a pleasurable experience rather than a problem and uh, transforming that. So this is when new companies are built or existing companies either get disrupted or come out of it in reinventing themselves. Thank you. Before we go to Jerry, I just want to say Lee, Jerry's other son, is adding his applause from California. So, Jerry, the question about creativity, please. Uh, <clears throat> let me try to link the, the question of creativity, which creativity is really a must in today's environment and always a bit important <clears throat> to the previous kind of uh, concern and question about the 50 the 40 percent of the people who were less optimistic in their response to the question. Uh, you have to realize that, first of all, the crisis we're dealing with is not only the coronavirus. It's really the triple crisis, with the coronavirus, the economic downturn, and the social unrest, uh, especially the call for social justice. And I think you have to look at the combination of these and realize that the new reality we're talking about is going to be different. It's not going to be going back because if you, we have to learn from the lessons of the last nine months. You know, with work from home that has been very successful, no one is going back and just ignoring the opportunity to work from home. But if you think about universities, all universities move to totally online education. To ignore it and going back to the old approach is absolutely crazy. So we have to start thinking about the new reality and how to operate there. And when you think about the new reality, one of the things you have to do is obviously understand, imagine the future, but then be creative in coming up with new ideas. So creativity is a learned skill. It's not that you're just born with this. You can actually learn and enhance creativity. I've been teaching a course on creativity for over 20 years at Wharton, the MBA program. And in the book, we are actually providing tools that you can use to try to enhance your own creativity and the creativity of your team. So keep in mind that creativity is a must and that you have to start uh, enhancing your and your team's skills in this area to try to be able to come with the right type of solutions to address the new reality we're going to deal with. Thank you. We only have a few minutes left. Uh, let's uh, take a look at the polling question that we've been asking. We are so happy to have people respond. What have you done to innovate during this crisis? Uh, so several options, continuous experimentation, reinvent business and revenue models, real, realign pro your product strategy, and recreate your org's architecture. So the number one is continuous experimentation. Nitin, let's ask for your thoughts on this. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, uh, it's very clear to us that as things changed overnight, you know, from a, a you know, standpoint of business as usual, people had really no choice but to find ways to get back up and running in whatever shape and form. So I think there was a lot of early experimentation that happened over the spring and summer. And of course, now we are starting to see that some of that will stick. And now, there's, you know, now the focus really is how do you, you know, take some of those and move them into 
long-term impactful you know business model changes and so on and so forth so not surprised to see this happen of course you know as phil talked about early on all of these eight principles actually have to go hand in hand if you really need to do sustainable transformation in your business and, and in your personal life as well so i think it's really important to keep that in mind as you go through these eight principles thank you uh, we only have a few minutes left with our all-star panel here folks please share your questions and your comments. We love hearing from you. And a reminder about the book. The book is available at transformationintimesofcrisis.com. You can find it on Amazon and other booksellers. We'd love for you to get that book. You can get it on Kindle today. Of course, you can also get the physical copy. We wish everyone could have had the physical copy in their hand for this moment, but our two authors do have the book. Uh, we have several comments coming in, and uh, we want to ask a couple of questions. Eric Bernstein says, what changes in your mental models enabled you to get the book out uh, so quickly during a major crisis? And its enormous utility is obviously partially a function of how quickly you got it out. So, Jerry, your thoughts on putting the book into action and kind of living the example you're trying to teach everyone else. Well, we primarily, as I mentioned before, we had uh, uh, started a book on the architecture of disruption, so we had many of the ideas already there. We just had to make a decision in early March, are we flipping the focus of the book to the crisis, which was easy. And then the second thing we did is, as opposed to going with traditional publishers that are typically expect nine months from the day of giving them the book to publish a book. We went with a very innovative in Indian publishing house that was able to get the book out in 40 days, which made all the difference in the world. And, and interestingly, an, an American uh, publishing house may have been slower at, the, uh, at doing this. So that's uh, an example of that innovation. Uh, Guarenda says, congrats from Toronto on the timely launch. Getting this book out in the middle of a crisis is certainly leading by example. We have more questions and comments that have been coming in, and we want to put a question up on the screen so we can ask our speakers uh, as these questions have been coming in. Everyone, please keep telling us where you're watching from, and don't forget, please tag your friends and share these questions with the, the video with your friends and colleagues all over the world. They can watch as soon as this is over. It will start from the beginning again. One of the things that uh, we, we want to ask is, what are your inferences while you connect the dots between the events of what happened in the past with the events that happened in 2020? How do you connect the dots? How do we make sure we learn those lessons? Phil first and then John. Um, I, um... I was going to comment that uh, I'm very interested, always have been, in your relationship to your customers. Uh, now, it's become standard for everyone to say they are running their firm with the customers as number one. The customers as number one. And um, if, you're, if you're really in, in the COVID situation that we're in, how do you show care for the customers. Yes, your product is fine. They like your product. They like your brand. But have you gone to what I call brand activism? You made your, you, your brand should mean more than the product you make. It should, it should, it should say you're a caring company. Uh, and we have many examples of, of companies that have caught on to that idea that basically they may have to go out of their way a little bit and help people aside from their job. Take, for example, the company called Salesforce that's run in, in uh, San Francisco. They have a thing called 111. And uh, 111, they're going to give away 1% of their product uh, uh, and they're going to uh, get, and the work, the employees are going to give 1% of their time to help customers. And uh, then there's going to be another 1%. So you have to look at some of these different systems. But it's, it's a more expansive view of what a company is. A company has to recognize there are society problems. And they can't ignore it. It's going to hit them too. So my great interest now is what can a company do to contribute to reducing the problems we have, water shortages, over timbering, overfishing, 
uh, like Coca-Cola is very much interested in water because without water, they can't make a Coke. So they're doing a great deal to make sure that water is, is conserved and used carefully. So every company should be more societal and not just customer focused only. Thank you. Thank you very much. John, your thoughts. Well, uh, I've always believed that your number one priority of, of your company should be your customer <laughs> success. And at Cisco, we led in terms of customer satisfaction across the whole technology industry for 20 years. Uh, I listened to every critical situation in the world every night where my customers were having problems because if I did, my team did as well. And we focused on it. And we literally used our customers as a form of experimentation using Jerry's and Nitten's concepts uh, that when we had an idea, we'd go to the customers and say, what do you think? And if they liked it, then we moved from experimentation into execution with tremendous speed. Out of the 180 acquisitions we did, probably 150 of them, our customers told us who to buy. But I want to hit on the point that Phil hit there at the end. Uh, I think there's, mm -hmm. there's a requirement for a new form of capitalism uh, that isn't just about financial return to the shareholders. If we don't balance society needs with return to the shareholders and running our business properly, you're going to see government intervention and regulation. Uh, that's the negative part, and most government leaders know they'll mess it up. So they're putting pressure on the companies to change rather than for, have the government force you to change. We are going to see change and regulation and antitrust coming to the U.S., because the companies did not move quick enough. But it's interesting, at Cisco, we run every corporate social responsibility award almost without exception there was in the world. Uh, we won it from the Democratic leadership of President Obama uh, and uh, uh, Secretary uh, Clinton uh, to George Bush and also uh, Secretary Rice. We won the awards in the Middle East. We won them in China and India. Interesting enough, where every country we were number one in corporate social responsibility, we were number one in market share and number one in profitability. Mm -hmm. I think these two areas must go together in the future, and I think companies need to move faster or government's going to help us. Thank you very much. Uh, we only have a couple of minutes left, so I'd like to get some final thoughts in here. I will point out that Elizabeth asked a question that you sort of answered, John, in talking about how how can companies work to make sure that they innovate on societal topics of family, childcare, and education? So, John, I'll ask you for a thought on that and then go to each of our guests with a finer, final comment. Well, to the point that Elizabeth was asking first is diverse teams uh, always have execute teams that look alike. So gender, color, skin, religion, et cetera. Uh, having that diversity is so important to the future. Uh, we focused at Cisco, and I try to focus on my 18 startups that I'm investing in coaching uh, on really treating your employees as family. And that's an old-fashioned concept, uh, and I think, Phil, you'll probably agree many companies don't do that. And sometimes the millennials change jobs every year to two years. But because of the way we did child care, because of the way we did uh, diversity on our board and throughout the entire company, because we treated people like family and when there was a problem, I knew every life-threatening situation of the 75,000 employees in the company, their spouses, their children, we were there for them like no one else. Our attrition rate ran 5% for 20 years and in the industry to France 15. And we were number one or number two in 16 of our 18 product categories. So that culture is often an overlooked attribute as important as vision and strategy of the company for those companies that are going to win. Thank you. I just want to, uh, before we go back to uh, asking the rest of the team, we just want to show uh, a question that we have a final question for our audience. We'd love to hear from you. So please take a look at this word cloud question. We are asking which aspect of your business would you like to change as a takeaway from this launch event and the book? Please answer in one word. We'd love to see the answers uh, as we, you can still keep answering them here. Uh, so what people are saying to us that what they what has helped them is understanding silos, transformation, innovation, et cetera. Uh, HR is something that someone's going to work on after this, which is which is great to see and change the culture and to have more courage in what they do. So I think the book already is having an impact in this way. So it's great to see that. Let me ask Phil for his final thoughts. Uh, well, I just finished a, a study of uh, what corporations uh, need to consider about their own 
mental model. And of course, that's the principle here about knowing your mental models and maybe reforming them. Uh, for example, the, or the average company says, my job is to make money for the shareholders. I, that's, I, they, they went, they're, they're the ones who took the risk and invested in my business. And now you know that many groups are saying, hey, how about stakeholders being the focus and not just shareholders? And that includes the employees too. I remember uh, Marriott Corporation telling me, the head of Marriott said, uh, employee, employees are more important than customers because if I can't get my employees to be good to the customers, I don't get to my customers. So here's the thing, uh, we must be very attentive to the idea that um, the, uh, we, of the business round table, the business round table with the leading people like John and others said, stakeholders, not shareholders alone is our goal. And then the World Economic Forum, uh, which is doing a great reset now, so that when they have their annual conference, what they're gonna be talking to the business people is what are you doing about being stakeholder oriented and not just uh, making money for the shareholders the shareholders are important let's not put that let's accept that but but this is a i'm saying that industry see government should be taking leadership in a number of areas but it is so uh it's so polarized and gridlocked that we have to depend on business leaders to save the nation business leaders are our hope and so I, I want to say this is a leave with that thought. Thank you, the great Phil Kotler, father of modern marketing, one of our two guests on this show, Phil Kotler. And well, of course we had John Chambers, who is the founder of JC2 Ventures and the former CEO of Cisco. Thank you both. We know you have multiple Zoom calls to go to right after this. So we'll let both of you go. Thank you very much for being here and thank you for supporting this book. Thanks, Phil and John. Yeah. Great. Congratulations, pretty nice job, Phil. Pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Same here. Always with my urge, John. <laughs> this this amazing convening power you're seeing of both Jerry and Nitin to bring these two guests onto the show with us today. So I'm going to go to Jerry and Nitin to give us some final thoughts. Over to you, Jerry. Uh, well, first of all, very quickly, the topic we discussed, and especially the last very important topic of the stakeholder, is clearly discussed and covered in the book so you could get more insight into it. If I were to suggest to any listener, whether from a business or a nonprofit organization or government, uh, three things, uh, which would be to challenge and change your mental model. You, you have to change your mental models if you're trying to deal effectively with the new reality. Two, select from the eight principles we have, the ones that are most relevant for you, customize them and experiment with initiatives around them to try to see how they can help you change your business and achieve your long-term objective. And most importantly, have the courage to do it. Because the big problem that I see in leadership of many, many organizations is the lack of courage of the leaders to act when it's needed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jerry. Uh, such great insights here and very helpful to everyone to have this. Before I go to Nitin, I want to remind everyone, you can find Transformation in Times of Crisis at your favorite book location, but you can buy it on Amazon right now. Please buy the book, order it. You can put in a review. I know our authors will be grateful. The, uh, the forward is by uh, Phil Kotler. Uh, so much to learn from this book. Please go to transformationintimesofcrisis.com or to Amazon to buy the book. You can get it in India, US, everywhere. Please do check out the book and, uh, and learn from it and leave a review because that really helps our authors. And we want to remind you that the other reason for you to support this book is that we are going to have proceeds from the book are going to go to Doctors Without Borders and to F1, the Emphasis Foundation. So this is a chance for you to uh, do something good while learning and, and understanding what is happening in this crisis. Nitin, I want to congratulate you on the book. So many great comments coming in, but also 
you know, we were caught up in this conversation to just reflect for a minute, to have Phil Kotler and John Chambers in a conversation is obviously fantastic and we learned a lot. And don't forget Jerry Wind, legendary professor himself. Uh, we've, well, you know, we keep calling him our co-author, but really he is a guru in the world of marketing. Uh, absolutely, Sri. I think uh, it is a little bit overwhelming for me, and I, I did mention that to, to, uh, to Phil as well. And Jerry's been a great coach and, and teacher. If it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have uh, even thought of actually writing this book. And even more importantly, if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have been able to change my own mental model in pivoting the book to the crisis. Because I actually, for the first you know call, I was fighting him hard, saying, you know, I'm not a crisis management expert. How can I write about the crisis? Uh, but I think, you know, there are many, many stories over the last, you know, few months as we work closely together. So thank you very much, Jerry, first and foremost, and most importantly, for making me learn through this process, putting up with my, you know, a lack of experience in, in this endeavor. I uh, really enjoyed the process and really thank you so much, uh, you know, Shri, for hosting the show. Again, a, a thanks for, for having, you know, Phil and, and John. Thank you for both of them. Uh, and, and most importantly, thank you for all the viewers. I'm told we have more than 30,000 people logged in and not including a few channels that we're still counting. So this is amazing. Uh, this is a really, really, uh, you know, a, a great sign of confidence in the fact that we hit on a topic that people want to learn from. So thank you so much. Enjoy the book and happy transforming. Oh, thank you. Happy transforming is a great line. Nitin, before you go, I want to ask you, we have young people who are watching this show and will be people are, people have said in their comments, they're already having their families watch. What is your message for folks who, uh, what can they learn from your story? You grew up in a small town outside Delhi, and now you are here, a global CEO of a global company. Uh, what is your message? Uh, I think uh, this is a journey. We are living through some really exciting times. Uh, the only ones, you know, we are all CEOs in our own rights, you know, and the number one thing we can do for ourselves is, uh, you know, take the opportunity that, that is presented, go find it, uh, you know, we are CEOs of our own careers. So I think that that's, that's my simple message. Uh, be forward leaning. Uh, enjoy the, the amazing transformative times you're living through. Uh, you know, take, take lessons from it and get inspiration from wherever you can find it. Thank you. And Jerry, congrats to you also. Uh, you both did a fantastic job today on this conversation. But the book is one of your many legacies that you leave for people to learn. So we want to share that with everyone. Please go to transformationintimesofcrisis.com. Thank you all for watching. Please send in your feedback. We would love for you to follow our guests on their social platforms. And please follow Transformation in Times of Crisis is also on social on the various channels. So thank you very much, everybody. We'll see you again and check out the book. Thank you. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thank you, guys. All right. Thanks.